We're going to talk about quantum materials. I'm going to begin by talking about some transport measurements we can make with lock-in amplifiers. Then Corey, Professor Corey Ray McRae of CU Boulder will, take, will tell us about what you can learn from uh, resonator measurements particularly and why that accelerates your qubit development. And then I will come back and, and talk about how we measure resonators with Poundriever Hall, uh, the Poundriever Hall technique. So Zurich Instruments was founded in 2008. We've grown to be a worldwide company. It's a wonderfully fun place to work. If you want to hear more about this, please ask me or anyone else at Zurich Instruments. We make lock-in amplifiers, impedance analyzers, arbitrary waveform generators, and quantum computing control systems that work from under a millihertz to eight and a half gigahertz. So now we're going to talk about the transport measurements. Uh, when we want to build qubits, superconducting, quantum dots, and so on, uh, we need many different materials. It might be normal metals, superconductors, semiconductors, certainly insulators. We have to be concerned with interfaces and surfaces. And I point out that these structures are small and planar, so the surface may have an outsized role. Uh, we use a, a lock-in amplifier for a measurement in order that we can modulate our signal and get up above the low frequency drift and noise, the one over F noise, <clears throat> uh, and position our measurement in frequency space uh, in a place that's favorable where the noise is a minimum. Uh, with a digital lock-in amplifier, we can offer additional tools. Suppose you come into the lab one morning and you find that the signals coming out of the demodulator don't make any sense at all. And from the post-demodulator signals, uh, you can't make any sense of it. With the digital lock-in amplifier, you can quickly jump to the oscilloscope measurement on the input side, look at the uh, time or frequency domain, and you can often identify a, a noise source such as a power line uh, interference or a switching power supply and so on. Uh, we can also offer you additional optional tools, an arbitrary waveform generator, a uh, feedback system based on proportional integral differential control, or a phase lock loop. Uh, and these tools, this, these tools end up making the, the uh, digital lock-in amplifier uh, a rather premium uh, device for uh, <clears throat> signal processing. So we can characterize noise <clears throat> in the time domain. Uh, we, can, we can have a, a record. Uh, we can monitor the input signal either in the time or the frequency domain. We've got a, a Fourier spectrum there. And uh, after the demodulator, we can monitor the post-demodulator spectrum, focus in on that narrow band of frequencies, which is often a useful thing to do. We can make a precision measurement of the noise with a swept demodulator. Uh, and also, if we wish to look and measure precisely a very low noise level that's below the noise of our amplifier, we can use two independent channels and do a cross-correlation measurement. So if we have a material and we want to measure transport through it, we apply a voltage, we measure the current, and uh, then we can get a, a conductivity out of this, uh, a, a conductance out of this, and we measure <clears throat> that as a function of temperature. We get the characteristic of a normal metal or a superconductor or a semiconductor. Uh, we can study the effect of adding a gate voltage. We can <clears throat> um, add a magnetic field. Uh, and we can measure a number of properties about the material that we have made. In particular, when we try to make an insulating gate, is it really insulating? Uh, when we try to measure and make an ohmic contact, uh, is it really an ohmic contact? So here's a lock-in amplifier measuring, measuring a sample. And um, uh, we're measuring the IV curve versus DC. We can measure it. Uh, with a DC bias at AC, so we get the slope of that curve. <clears throat> um, now, if the contact resistance is important, we can measure separately the uh, resistance of just the sample with a four-terminal technique, where those, uh, the contact resistance is shown in the red dashed boxes, and the uh, voltage leads have draw no current. Therefore, there is no voltage drop across their resistance, including their contact resistance. And so you get the true voltage in the sample from the voltage leads, and the current is injected via the current leads. Um, 
then we separately can also have the uh, value of the resistance of the ohmic contacts. So uh, we, get, we get the whole picture that way. And um, so we can also make a Hall measurement in which we measure the voltage transverse to both the magnetic field and the current. And that can tell us about carrier mobility and density. And if we wish to do this, uh, measuring the longitudinal resistance and the Hall resistance simultaneously, uh, we can couple two lock-in amplifiers and make them work as one. So now a quantum dot is an object uh, in which the charge carriers are confined in three dimensions. Therefore, they, they get discrete energy levels. And uh, these en energy levels down at the level of, of one or a few electrons uh, play a, an essential role in their conductivity. So we attach a source and drain contact uh, to measure uh, conductance and we apply a gate we have a, a gate nearby so that we can affect the energy levels with respect to the source and drain contact so on the right uh, if we have no energy level in the dot that is in between the energies of the source and drain contacts there's no current and we're in the gray region of the di diagram with diamonds at the top um, if we change the gate source and drain voltages to bring an energy level into the range between the source and drain, then we can have conductance and uh, we move out of the gray regions uh, and uh, elaborating the whole pattern with the drain source voltage on the horizontal axis and the gate voltage on the vertical axis, uh, we get that uh, diamond diagram. And then the one in the middle is bigger because there we have two electrons on the dot uh, one spin up and one spin down, and um, the energy is higher because of Coulomb repulsion. So we can use a lock-in amplifier to measure this uh, plot, now, to measure this map, this diamond diagram. Uh, we can apply the uh, an AC signal. Uh, it's going to be a very small signal. It's just one electron. So we're going to apply an AC signal and uh, measure the AC current, and then. Um, We'll, we'll step the gate, we'll sweep the source drain voltage, we'll step the gate voltage, and we'll map out that diagram. And that can be a fairly slow process. So we can speed things up. We can build an RF matching network outside the dot. Uh, we can drive it with several hundred megahertz on resonance. And uh, then tiny changes in the par model parameters of the quantum dot due to changes in the biases uh, will result will be measurable in changes in the reflected uh, reflected amplitude and phase, and those amplitudes and phase are measured by the lock-in amplifier um, via that circulator. So we can apply the we can apply the biases through bias T's. Um, that's what they're for, and uh, working at several hundred megahertz getting above 1 over F noise and taking advantage of our single or few electrons, cycling them back and forth at radio frequencies, we make this measurement rocket fast. These data were taken in one second for that nice map, uh, the nice map in the bottom left. So uh, what we've heard about in the transport measurements section is that we can me measure transport, we can measure noise phenomena, and by engineering the measurement system a bit, we can sometimes make dramatic improvements. Now I'd like to turn it over to Corey Ray to tell us about resonators. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, why we would use superconducting microwave resonators to understand more about materials losses that limit our qubit development. So the problems I'm talking about here are um, towards uh, a solution for large-scale superconducting quantum computing. So what I mean by uh, large-scale superconducting quantum computing would be having thousands of high-performance, high-coherence superconducting qubits um, that would work together to solve large-scale problems. Right now, we are severely limited in terms of our single qubit coherence, um, and we know that that is due to materials losses that arise in certain regions of our device um, and uh, limit the, the T1 of our qubits um, to, uh, to hundreds of microseconds. So 
Uh, we, we don't know a lot about the microscopic origins of these materials losses, but we do know where in our devices uh, they often reside. And that is uh, in dielectrics and interfaces between materials. So um, we have our bulk dielectric substrate, which con contributes, but we also have surface oxides um, and then contamination and defect layers between materials. Uh, so these losses, uh, these dielectric losses, um, they arise at the in the regime that uh, superconducting qubits operate. So this is a very extreme regime, millikelvin temperatures, microwave frequencies, and ultra low powers, single photon powers. Um, so we can see why these would be this would be a very difficult regime to probe with standard materials characterization methods. And so we end up measuring the devices themselves in order to learn more about these materials losses. So uh, for example, we could use the relaxation time T1 of a qubit uh, in order to learn more about what the, uh, the losses are that exist within this device. Um, you could think of a very simple experiment where you would have two qubits that have uh, two uh, are made up of two different material sets, and we want to directly compare them to determine which one is better, which one performs better. Um, this is not as easy as you may think. Uh, there are no good mechanisms currently to disentangle loss channels within uh, individual uh, qubit measurements. And as we see here, uh, if we look at the relaxation time of a single qubit over a long time period, we see many um, uh, a very complex dynamics, um, some very significant fluctuations in performance over time. And we know that uh, extremely long time scans are required in order to obtain reproducible performance information for a single qubit. So um, tens or up to 100 hours of data would um, be required in order to have a metric that um, if we uh, warmed up our device and cooled it back down again, we would uh, receive similar uh, T1 within uh, statistical significance. So uh, in order to get around some of the issues we see with measuring relaxation time in order to obtain this materials information, we measure devices that are dominated by the same materials loss mechanisms as qubits, superconducting microwave resonators. We measure these devices in the same regime at ultra low powers, millikelvin temperatures, microwave frequencies, and we can perform experiments that aren't available to us when we measure qubits that allow us to disentangle loss channels. So it's very simple ones would be performing power or temperature sweeps of the device and then fitting to a materials loss model in order to distinguish between uh, these loss channels. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, one other benefit with using resonators is that they don't have a Josephson junction. Um, this, uh, this allows us to focus the sensitivity of the device to um, fewer number of regions that will cause loss, um, which al allows us to um, perform experiments uh, in a more controlled way. It, it also, ha having uh, no Joseph's Joseph injunction imp improves the reproducibility of the measurements of these devices, and we don't see as much uh, variation in the loss. Now, that being said, um, the reason that we're measuring these superconducting microwave resonators in these instances is to improve our qubit performance, so we always want to bring things back to uh, to the qubit performance ultimately. So there are several different types of resonators that we implement when we're performing uh, materials experiments towards superconducting qubits. Uh, and they, they can each give us different information about what's going on within superconducting qubits. So there are lumped element resonators, where we can do things like implement a thin film dielectric material that we may be interested in using in our circuit for 3D implementations for junctions. And we can implement that in, in this parallel plate capacitor, be very sensitive to the losses within that material and the associated interfaces. We can also do things um, like measure a very, very simple device, a 
superconductor uh, patterned on a bulk dielectric into a, a, a CPW, a coplanar waveguide. And this is probably the most common form of materials loss investigation that's being performed now for uh, improvements of state-of-the-art qubits. That's because our current state-of-the-art superconducting qubits, we know uh, are limited by losses inside the uh, the paddle capacitor or the, the large capacitor that is only made up of the superconductor on a bulk dielectric substrate. And so by measuring CPW resonators, we can be sensitive to the same regions in the device that are limiting those state-of-the-art devices. Um, and this allows us to extract information and perform these types of uh, materials comparisons that we're interested in. And then finally, a complementary technique is using 3D cavities um, and inserting bulk dielectric materials within those cavities. This can give us information about the loss of just the bulk dielectric substrate on which our planar devices reside without needing to actually fabricate planar devices and introduce other defect and contamination layers that would contribute to the loss. Okay, so in order to actually extract materials information from these devices, we need to measure them. Um, and we need to have a model that we use in order to extract uh, performance information from these measurements. So um, for, for the rest of the, the presentation, I'm gonna be talking largely about planar devices, but much of this can also be applied to 3D cavities. Um, so here is a common um, uh, circuit model that we use in order to describe our uh, resonators coupled to a feed line uh, with which we read out the device. We have our transmission line here. It's capacitively coupled and it can also be inductively coupled. We have our RLC circuit that represents our resonator and we perform a measurement with a vector network analyzer, a transmission measurement through our feed line. And we see that at the resonance frequency of our resonator, um, we get a dip in the magnitude of the transmission. We can also look at the imaginary and real uh, axes in order to see a resonance circle, which we can then fit to a model. And the reason that uh, we want to perform this fitting is so that we can extract the quality factor. The quality factor is the ratio of the energy stored in the resonator over the energy lost. And there can be um, different ways in which energy is lost uh, from this system. And we want to just distinguish between those ways because we're only interested really in one of these ways, right? We're interested in the materials losses. Um, we're not interested in the loss um, back to the rest of the circuit. The coupling quality factor describes that loss. So we definitely wanna distinguish between that. The internal quality factor uh, takes into account all of the other losses. So losses to the environment and also losses from the materials within the device themselves. Um, so even more uh, disentangling needs to occur in order to, after uh, obtaining the internal quality factor, uh, then, then further gaining information about just the materials loss itself. And the metric that we normally use is the loss, which is the, uh, the inverse of the internal quality factor. So that's what I'll be talking about for the majority of the presentation. So here's a little bit more about what, uh, more information on what a measurement system would look like if we're using a vector network analyzer to perform these types of transmission measurements of planar devices. Uh, we have our vector network analyzer here. Um, in this case, I'm assuming that we are varying the power uh, in order to obtain a power curve that we can then fit to a model to extract materials parameters. We have an input and output line going into the top of our dilution refrigerator and then down through several temperature stages to our 10 millikelvin stage on which our device under test is installed. Um, it's sitting inside our microwave packaging uh, and it has a, um, an input line that is heavily attenuated with cryogenic attenuators and has uh, some, uh, some filtering as well. And then on the output line, we have significant amount of isolation and some amplification. 
And so the reason that we need to um, have this kind of experimental setup is we need to be able to get down to very, very low powers, to um, sometimes even below a single photon of average power within our device. Um, and we need to also be able to get up to high powers in order uh, to, uh, to fit to the model that we're interested in, so around a million photons. Um, here I'm showing the loss, the inverse of the internal quality factor, as a function of the number of uh, the average number of photons in a device. Each of these points represents one transmission measurement. Um, here I'm showing an example of what one of these measurements would look like at very high power and at uh, the lowest power. And um, now the question is, so we, we gain this information, we fit to our Lorentzian model in, to obtain the uh, internal quality factor and thus the loss for each of these uh, power points. Now, how do we obtain materials information here? Uh, well, we need a model to fit to. Here we use generally the two-level system model, which comes from uh, work on behavior of amorphous and glassy materials um, at low temperature. The idea being that there's an ensemble of two-level defects within our uh, device within these amorphous regions, defect regions, contamin contamination regions in our device. And um, these have um, two level of defects, which uh, as the amount of uh, energy available to them increases, uh, they begin to saturate. So when none of the TLS are saturated at very, very low power, we see that loss is maximized. As these TLS begin to saturate, we see a decrease in loss until all of the TLS are saturated at some very high power and our loss is minimized. So we can apply this model um, shown here and then we're able to obtain um, two loss values, our TLS loss, uh, which we know is dominating at, in this low power regime where we measure qubits, and other losses, which are power independent um, and uh, make up a variety of different types of loss that just don't have a power dependence in the, the power regime we're looking at. Um, so they can be things like vortex loss, quasi-particle loss, um, uh, coupling to uh, packaging, coupling to spurious modes. So, um, so this allows us to do some disentangling. And I just wanted to give a little bit more information about uh, the time scales that a, an experiment like this would take. So we see that at, um, at very low power, uh, our measurement time can be, uh, can be significant. Um, this is without parametric amplification, we would see an improvement with the addition of parametric amplification, but it's still non-trivial and can lead to um, a significant amount of time taken if we want to perform a statistically significant number of measurements uh, when performing a large experiment. For example, if we're performing an experiment as shown here, which is um, recent results taken um, with uh, Northwestern through the, the Superconducting Quantum Materials and Systems Center, uh, this experiment took about one and a half weeks. Um, we have six to eight resonators per uh, surface treatment. The goal here being to determine which surface treatments of niobium cause um, uh, can can decrease loss in the best way um, compared to the control where we see no surface treatment. Uh, and an interesting thing that we were able to see here is we were able to distinguish between uh, changes in TLS loss, which are fairly minor, and changes in other losses, um, which in some of these cases were significant. And this really shows the uh, importance of being able to distinguish between uh, loss mechanisms in order to be able to improve our qubit performance and, and guide uh, our understanding of what is limiting our devices. Another um, really neat thing we can do when we perform these types of uh, materials loss investigations is we can compare then to the rest of the field. So here I'm showing the, um, the TLS loss written in a couple of different forms, depending on how people chose to report it in their uh, published works, as a function of uh, the geometry of the coplanar waveguide resonator. So in this case, it's the gap of between the conductor and the ground plane within the CPW. 
So that means that as uh, the, the gap grows larger, um, we expect to have less participation of the lossy regions uh, in our device and thus um, a reduced lo measured loss, even with no change in the loss of the materials themselves. So if we're interested in actually decreasing loss of materials and not just um, seeing less loss because we're not as sensitive to it because we're making large devices, what we're interested in looking at in this figure is decreasing interface loss along the diagonal here. So um, these points over here are the state of the art in the field in terms of um, materials performance. Um, and being able to uh, perform these types of uh, loss extractions by performing careful measurements of the internal quality factor of our devices um, as a function of, of power or temperature. We're able to perform these comparisons and say um, how are various materials performing against each other. Um, in my experiment was the was the improvement I saw um, did you know, is it worth doing the extra steps that, that I did in order to see that improvement? Um, it allows us to ground our understanding. Okay, so I, th I've been talking about using uh, S-parameter measurements with a VNA in order to extract the internal quality factor for these measurements, but that's not the only method. And there are some reasons why we would choose to use other methods to measure uh, superconducting microwave resonators. One being that, especially for 3D cavities, um, we can see very narrow line widths, which can be difficult to uh, measure with a VNA, practically. And uh, so using a pulsed scheme such as ring down um, allows us to gain the same information um, without uh, needing to, um, to search for a very narrow line width when we have a very high Q cavity. Um, another example is the Pound River Hall PDH method um, that Jim will be talking more about. Uh, it, historically, it's been mostly used for frequency noise characterizations in superconducting microwave resonators. Um, and the, it's very useful for that due to the, the, the frequency locking. But it's also been used for real-time measurements of changes in Q, as shown in this work. Um, and uh, this can allow us to gain um, information more rapidly and also um, uh, gain more information about noise inside these devices. So why would we want to learn more about noise within our superconducting microwave resonators? Well, um, in the past, when, we, when this has been uh, explored, the uh, resonator uh, frequency noise gave us information at, with even, at even uh, the slow fluctuation limit that allowed us to learn more about how TLS behave, how they interact with each other. And it caused us to expand our understanding of the um, TLS loss model to include general, uh, the generalized tunneling model, um, which includes TLS-TLS interactions. Uh, this in turn gave us the ability to, um, to explain why we see some of these very large uh, T1 fluctuations in our qubits uh, due to TLS interacting with one another um, and then in, in turn interacting with the qubit. So by further expanding um, the uh, regime, the, the, the frequency regime in which we're looking at noise, we could gain even more insight into what, um, into how these losses behave, how, how these loss channels are interacting with our devices and how we can mitigate them. And additionally, including um, noise in QI could, could give us an additional um, set of information that could help with this. So in summary, superconducting qubit lifetimes are currently materials limited, and this is uh, impeding us from scaling up to large scale superconducting quantum computing systems. Um, resonators end up being very useful in order to investigate these uh, materials in the same regime that superconducting qubits operate at. 
standard VNAS parameter measurements have been very useful up to this point and are, are uh, highly used in the field, but can be time consuming. And more rapid measurements would allow uh, a higher throughput, which would allow us to perform just better materials experiments with um, be able to measure more devices in the same amount of time, um, have uh, higher quality data and perform more experiments. And uh, additionally, having higher frequency noise characterization would give us more information about how these uh, TLS systems behave. So if you have any questions about what I've talked about, please feel free to um, add it to the Q&A so that we can discuss those questions at the end. And I will hand this back over to Jim. So let me just summarize a few things from Corey Ray's presentation. When we measure resonators, they're easier to fabricate. Um, they are easier to set up and measure. <clears throat> We can measure them over a wide range of power levels, including to power levels well below and well above those at which you can operate a qubit and make measurements. And um, we can measure them to much higher temperatures than we can measure a qubit. And these measurements are important for discerning these various loss mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, that's why we that's why we want to measure resonators additionally resonators uh are an important component so perfecting them not only tells us about the loss mechanisms in the whole qubit uh, but it also allows us to optimize one component um, particularly <clears throat> so these pound river hall measurements have been used to measure frequency center frequency fluctuations the challenge um is uh, that we uh, that that has been addressed and that we continue to address is to measure center frequency of a resonator as quickly as possible at low power. Obviously, you're somewhat limited. If you've got a uh, hundredth of a photon in the resonator, you're getting photons out at maybe an average rate of 50 a second. So there's there's some limitation there. Uh, but we want to improve upon the speed of existing measurements as much as we can. We also want to measure Q. And the pound river hall method measures Q directly. So um, uh, we do that by measuring at the second harmonic. Uh, this has been done, and uh, we are aiming to continue this work and to develop it. Here are several methods for measuring a resonator. Uh, with a VNA, we measure at a number of different frequencies. With a phase lock loop, we measure at a single frequency, and we use feedback in that and all the other measurements shown on this slide except the DNA to hold that, uh, that carrier on the center of the resonance. Dual frequency resonance tracking, we measure with two carriers, and we hold them symmetrically placed about the resonance center. And pound river hall, we use a frequency modulated carrier, and we hold that uh, centered on the resonance. And uh, so what are we measuring? With the VNA, we measure amplitude and phase. We do a least squares fit. Uh, and after the fact, we come up with a uh, center frequency and a Q. This measurement tends to be somewhat slower. The, uh, with the phase lock loop, the measurements are very fast. We have a continuously running oscillator whose current frequency is the current resonance frequency of the system. Uh, we are measuring the phase of the transfer function of the resonator, and we're feeding back to hold that at a chosen set point. With dual frequency resonance tracking, it's similar, except we are using two carriers, one each side of the resonance, and we're balancing the amplitude of their response. And with Pound River Hall, it's based on the uh, conversion of frequency modulation to amplitude modulation by the resonator when the carrier is off the resonance center. Uh, and in fact, we obtain a signal which is linear in the departure, in small departures from the resonance center uh, by demodulating uh, and by first applying a power detector to get the amplitude modulation and then demodulating. And um, so. Um, now, Pound River Hall is based on the conversion. Well, first of all, Pound River Hall was. Um, invented better part of a century ago 
and uh, has been used in the microwaves and in a, a great deal in optical experiments and has figured in a number of Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, sets of work. Uh, so it's well established, especially in the optical, uh, which is where I did it. And um, so let's talk about frequency modulation and amplitude modulation. Um, frequency modulation, we have a, a signal of constant amplitude with a variable frequency modulated, in this case sinusoidally, and uh, amplitude modulation, the opposite. We have a frequency, signal of constant frequency modulated in amplitude at that modulation frequency. In frequency space, we represent that as these sets of arrows uh, where amplitude modulation has the carrier in the upper and lower sidebands. And um, when you do the power detection to measure the amplitude modulation, the, uh, that's a nonlinear process which mixes the carrier with the upper and lower sidebands. And there is a beat signal at the difference frequency, which is the modulation frequency. For amplitude modulation, those carrier phases, those, those sideband phases are set such that the signals add and you have amplitude modulation. For frequency modulation, the uh, sideband phases are set so that those can signals cancel and we have no amplitude modulation, which is what we set out to make for frequency modulation. So uh, the pound driver hall error signal arises uh, if we think of the instantaneous frequency um, and think in, in, in the time domain, the instantaneous frequency is wobbling back and forth across the resonance minimum. Uh, one cycle of the modulation uh, takes it up the curve each side twice and down twice, um, and there is no there is no signal uh, at the single frequency uh, modulation uh, at the at the modulation at the, the modulation frequency. Um, the the uh, if where carrier is displaced, say on the high frequency side. Uh, there is a first order signal. The intensity rises when the frequency rises, opposite on the other side. So that's how we get an amplitude modulation that is linear in, uh, in the first order in the departure of the resonant of the oscillator frequency from the resonance frequency. So um, now, um, so here is a, that. That's a nice signal for feedback. Here is a feedback system that we're going to build up. Uh, we're applying a frequency modulated signal, in this case at 4.53 gigahertz, uh, to a resonator. And um, it, the, there's a, some detuning, so that signal acquires some amplitude modulation in addition to its frequency modulation, uh, and it comes out. And we want to collect the uh, magnitude the, of that amplitude modulation, the amplitude of that amplitude modulation. So we use a power detector, and that picks off the uh, envelope, a little filtering. And uh, so now we have a signal at the modulation frequency, and we feed it to the lock-in amplifier, which demodulates it at that frequency, which for this example is 150 kilohertz. Um, so now we have the demodulated signal. We pass it through our PID loop filter, and we use that loop filter signal to control the frequency, the center frequency, of a set of oscillators. There's the carrier and the upper and lower sideband oscillators, and the digital lock-in amplifier provides all these, keeps those oscillators at the modulation frequency separate from the carrier, and tunes the whole set. So now that set is up converted to 4.53 gigahertz, and we are uh, exploring the resonator. We've completed a feedback loop, so the AM will disappear, and it will keep the carrier centered on the resonator. Uh, here's actual data uh, of that uh, first order uh, F sub M demodulation of the, uh, the, it's the pound driver hall error signal. So we have a frequency modulated signal which is coming from low frequency at the left to high frequency at the right. Uh, the resonance is at 4.53 gigahertz. When the uh, upper sideband first interacts with the resonator, we get the, the first feature that you see there. The carrier interacts, we get the nice strong feature in the middle. That's the one that we use for the pound driver hall locking usually. And then when, when we go off to higher frequency, the lower sideband interacts, uh, and that's, that's the full trace. And the spacing there is the modulation frequency, 150 kilohertz. So here's actual data, time series of the locked uh, frequency fluctuations uh, directly measured. And uh, the standard deviation of those numbers can be as low as 100 hertz. Um, 
and uh, that's about five minutes of data. So now, how do we measure Q? <clears throat> well, um, as I mentioned before, when the uh, oscillator is centered on the, on the resonance frequency, the, there is no signal at the modulation frequency F sub M, but as the carrier oscillates back and forth across the center, there are two cycles of intensity for one cycle of frequency modulation. Uh, so there is a, a strong double frequency signal, and it has a lot to do with the width, the line width of the resonance. So that's a nice heuristic argument. You see the models plotted there. Um, that those are as a as a function of the modulation frequency normalized to the line width. Um, uh, the uh, expected double frequency or second order uh, frequency modulation signal. Uh, which is the Q signal, uh, as a function of that modulation frequency. And you can see there's a nice transition that we can measure uh, for all of those cases, which are cases of the ratio of the total Q to the coupling Q. Um, there's, there's a nice transition that we can measure when the modulation frequency is about equal to the line width. So uh, that should be a good signal to measure. And we can even get out the, the total Q and the coupling Q parameters uh, from a fit to those curves. Now. How often, in a new collaboration, do you, get, do you get to show data that looks like this? Um, we have uh, Q data, two fr double frequency uh, demodulated data. That is, it is hard to tell from the model. If you, uh, you've, if you look closely, you'll see some discrepancies. So this is the result of measurements, uh, two different measurements on a co uh, a coplanar waveguide resonator. It's at 10 millikelvin, and the power level is a minus 100 dBm. Measured with uh, PDH, second harmonic detection, and with the VNA. Uh, the frequencies agree uh, near enough, and the Q values are somewhat different. Um, the, uh, the fit value obtained with the, uh, with the PDH method uh, and the PDH data are shown on that set of curves there. Uh, and the agreement is close. Uh, in order to determine how well this method can distinguish against other values of Q, we took the value of Q obtained with the uh, swept frequency or VNA measurement uh, and plotted that model, but with that uh, artificially displaced value of Q. And uh, you can see that clearly we can discriminate among the, those, uh, those different Q values. Um, now, the values are different. We're, we're not sure why. This is first data, and, and we're still working out what it means. Uh, now, how would we push this further? Uh, this started with a, a conversation with Alicia Kolar at the University of Maryland, uh, who told me about a related measurement made in the optical, where you wanted a weak signal in the resonator, and you wanted a strong PDH signal. So we first observed that the PDH system uh, the first order error signal develops fine even when the uh, sidebands have nothing to do with the resonator, when they're miles outside the resonator line width. So that allows us to put them out there. And now we observe that the PDH signal is proportional to the product of the carrier field and the sideband field. So we can have a weak, car at, at a, we can have a weak carrier in the resonator, uh, a strong sidebands, we get the advantage of uh, low power in the resonator and a stronger sideband signal. So we want to try this out. Now, um, if we amplify the signal as one, is usu one usually does in the microwaves with a linear amplifier, um, whether it's in situ or not, whether it's low noise or not, it, it inevitably mixes some noise with that carrier, and we've lost the advantage that we gained uh, it mixes the noise with the carrier before it is mixed with the sideband and converted with that stronger sideband field uh, to a, a lower frequency signal. Um, so we've lost the advantage if we amplify with a linear amplifier. Uh, to get around that, we need a quantum limited uh, power detector, uh, a nonlinear device, and we're looking at devices that can fill that role. Uh, so the takeaways. Uh, with a digital, digital lock-in amplifier and PDH, <clears throat> you can measure frequent resonance 
resonator center frequency rapidly, you can measure frequency fluctuations. Uh, there's a direct measure of Q, and by, by demodulating at the second harmonic, we can work over a wide range of powers and temperatures. The digital lock and amplifier works nicely over a range of powers because it can generate that signal at a wide dynamic range without recalibrating an analog modulator frequently, and that, that's a, a big convenience. Um, and uh, our team has demonstrated these measurements, and we're working to perfect them. And we'd like to we'd like to even advance the state of the art. So with that, I will I will close. Thank you. Thank you.